Let's welcome Pastor Scott as he comes. Hallelujah. I'm going to go to Exodus uh, chapter number 23 to begin today. Exodus chapter number 23. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you and praise you for your goodness, your faithfulness. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have this morning to look into your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit quickening that word into our spirit. Lord, I thank you that we receive that with joy and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I feel like I have just a little bit of a too much, a little echo. All right. In, uh, we read about God's faithfulness to his people. Whenever his people were in bondage, we know the story in Egypt, and God sent a number of miracles, plagues they were against the Egyptians in order to bring his people out, with the final one being the Passover, brought his people out. They were being chased by, by Pharaoh and, and, and the army, and you know God miraculously allowed them to go through the Red Sea. We know that story. And after they got through the, the, the Red Sea on dry ground, as Pharaoh's army tried to follow through, God brought the Red Sea back upon them and destroyed the entire army and um, got them out. They started into the wilderness, and God had a plan for them. God had a destiny for them. He wanted to take them into a promised land. We know that, you know, you've heard me say it many times that that is uh, indicative of our own journey when we were in bondage to sin and our sin nature and God sent a deliverer for us and redeemed us out of our Egypt or out of our bondage and set us free and, uh, and then had a purpose for us. He brought us out to take us in, okay? He had a, he had a land, he had a destiny, okay, for us to fulfill, Many Christians don't. What, what happens to Christians or anyone that do not understand what their destiny is? They wander. And that's what happened to the Israelites. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, uh, going in circles, no sense of direction, not sure what they're doing. And, uh, and, plus, and, and the whole thing that starts the wandering and that vagabond spirit, I think I, I preached about that last, a couple weeks ago, that vagabond spirit comes upon people who do not submit to the word of God. And that's what happened. When God came and said, I want, you know, they didn't believe God. They, they rebelled against the things of God. And that rebellion sends people into a wandering, sends people into a never being satisfied, uh, that type of thing that they, that they encountered. But in the midst of it, God was still faithful. God provided them miraculously bread, meat, water, brought it out of a rock. They got to the place, and God still was, had this plan for them. And I want you to see this, and this is in Exodus chapter number 23. We'll start with verse number 23. And it said this. The Lord's talk, speaking to him. He said, my angel will go before you and will bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, these are all going to be enemies. These were the enemies that were in the land. And here's what God said. And I... I, God said, I will cut them off. God's saying, I'm going to take care of your enemies. That's what he said. Okay, now we have that promise from God, right? How many know that, the, that, the, that our main enemy, uh, being the devil, okay, our main enemy has been already utterly cut off and destroyed? Did you know that? That took place at the cross. Okay, that's already been done. Now, that doesn't mean that we still don't deal with enemies in the land. How many know that the main enemy of Israel was the Egyptians, and they were all gone? They were drowned in the Red Sea, but there were still other, others that they were going to have to encounter, okay, along their journey. Now, I want you to see this. In verse 24, he says, You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. So God said, I'm sending you into the midst of people who hate you. I'm sending you into the midst of of enemies, and I want you to rule there. I want you to bring them down. You, verse 25, shall serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. God's saying, I'm gonna, you're not even going to be sick. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. In other words, I look at this in a spiritual way, that God says, when I give you something, when you have a gift or talent or a promise from me, I will bring it to fruition. It will not be aborted. You understand that? It will come forth. You won't be barren when the th with the things of God. 
Okay? I will fulfill the number of your days. Verse 27. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. And now we come to the verse that can be perplexing to many people. And it's verse number 29. God says, I'm going to do all this for you, and watch 29. And you've got to get a hold of this. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. He said, in your journey of life, I took care of the devil at the cross. There are going to be many other enemies that you're going to encounter. And God says, and I'm, and I'll, I'm going to do it. I'm going to help you through this. But I'm not going to do it all at once. See, everybody's answer to their problems is, God, just deliver me out and remove all my enemies. And if all my enemies were gone instantly, I could serve you. I could, I could fulfill my, your, your promises to me. I can, I, can, I, I can do what you call me to do. I just need rid of all these enemies that I need rid, rid of right now. If you could just get rid of them all for me. And God said, That's not, no, we're not going to do that. If you can grab this, that the enemies that you have in your life are there for a purpose, you'll get set free today. If you can change your mind and understand that. And God says, I'm not going to remove them all. And I'm not gonna, definitely not going to do it instantly. Okay, so this is, an, this is a mentality you've got you to break in your mind. Now watch this. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Verse 30, little by little I will drive them out from before you. Little by little I will drive them out before you until you have increased and then you'll inherit the land. So God said, now watch. Because God is concerned about your increase. As you increase, as you grow in the things of God, as you become stronger in Him, God said, little by little, I'll start to drive them out. I won't do it all once. But as you grow, I'll drive. As you grow, I'll drive another one out. As you draw closer to me, I'll drive another one out. As you grow in the fruit of the Spirit, you develop more love. You walk in more joy more peace, patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and exhibit self-control. As you do these things, God says, I'll start driving the enemies out one by one. So you got to have a different mentality of how you look at the enemy. you got to begin to see that God actually uses it. God uses the enemy. Remember, I don't remember when, I can't remember what I share Sundays or Wednesdays, or, but you cannot fulfill your destiny without an enemy. That's impossible. You can't do it. See, we think, well, just get rid of the enemy and I'll fulfill my destiny. You will never be able to fulfill your destiny without an enemy. Jesus is our prime example. Jesus had a destiny when he came to this earth. He was brought to this earth for one thing, and it was to die on behalf of your sin. That's why he came. He could never have fulfilled that purpose without an enemy. He needed an enemy. He needed an enemy to take him to the cross. He needed an enemy to kill him. And it was all part of the plan of God. And we see this in the scriptures. You need to begin to understand that your enemies or obstacles or problems become your servants. Obstacles become your servants. Obstacles actually begin to serve a purpose. See, we look at obstacles as a problem, and they are. But we look at them that but we, if we can understand how to approach that problem, if we can begin to understand the purpose of that, it's making us stronger. You see, anybody can go through life without an obstacle course. But God's created our lives to, have, to be like an obstacle course. We have to have things to overcome. God even calls us in the Scripture overcomers. Okay? You cannot be an overcomer if you don't have something to overcome. 
you'll never be an overcomer. So there has to be things to overcome. There has to be these things. Now, we all have them. The difference is how do we approach it? How do we see it? Do we learn? Do we grow? Do we mature through these things? You see, when we looked at the uh, life of Joseph, and we did this before in a, in a, a few weeks ago, we looked at Joseph's life and what happened to this young man. This is a, you know, we, we, we read about him, we first read about Joseph really when he was like 17 years old. You've heard me share about him at 17. He was immature. He was an immature young man. But he had, he had goals. He had, he had God to give him dreams. He had a destiny. God showed him that he was going to rule someday. And, and, but it didn't, it didn't start out that way. He was hated. His, he shared some of his dreams with his brothers. His brothers hated him. They hated him so bad they wanted to kill him. Uh, they threw him into a pit. I mean, this is a terrible, terrible thing. They're going to kill him, but, but there was an intervention, and some Ishmaelites were going by, and they, they said, hey, we can make some money off this, and they sold him into slavery, took him down in Egypt. There he was sold to a, to a man by the name of Potiphar, and he started serving in his house. There he was falsely accused. We know the story. Wife falsely accused him, had him thrown into prison. He was there for years, until finally, after 13 years, of the promises of God and all the obstacles and all the enemies that were along that path of 13 years, he fulfilled what God had called him to do. I want you to see something that he said. And this is in Exodus, or this is in Genesis chapter 50. At the end of his life, he made this statement in verse 20. And he's talking to his brothers. These are his brothers who sold him into slavery. These are his brothers who threw him into the pit and wanted to kill him and hated his guts. And he said this to his brothers in verse, chapter 50, verse 20. As for you, he said, you meant evil against me. That was your purpose. That's what you meant. That was your intent. But God meant it for good. You've got to see this. Your enemies mean evil against you. People who say things about you, falsely accuse you. They, they mean it for evil. They're not, they're not trying to help you out. But in the midst of them saying it and doing it for the wrong purpose, God says, I'm doing it for your good. It's not comfortable when you go through it. Who like, who, I mean, who, who just really likes to be lied about? My gosh, we went into the ministry and people started lying about us. Other ministers told, lied, lied, spread lies about us, said things that were false made stories up about us. Some of the stuff that got back, it was incredible. Anyway, it wasn't fun, but God used it. They meant it for evil, but God used it for our good. God used it for our good. You know, it was something funny. So, um, the one, one guy started coming here. He was at a church, and, and, and they talked so bad about us that when he got mad at the church, he said, I'm going over to that one they hate. <laughs> he got mad at them and he said I'm going to go to that church they hate him so bad I'll just go there <laughs> so we picked up a guy for, anyway <laughs> Psalm chapter 105 kind of tells a story Psalm 105 verse 16 this was kind of the uh, summary uh, that what went on with Joseph and at the time, Psalm 105, we'll start at verse number 16. It said, moreover, he called for a famine in the land. It's talking about God. Called for a famine in the land, destroyed all the provision of bread. He sent, he sent, watch this, he sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Who sent him? See, Joseph thought, I'm just a victim here. I didn't do anything wrong. And that I end up in a pit. My brothers want to kill me. I'm sold into slavery. And afterwards we find out God was arranging the whole thing. It was all part of God's plan. Sure it wasn't comfortable at the time for Joseph. It said, verse 18, they hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. He was in chains. Talk about uncomfortable. Pain, suffering that he's enduring. And God's saying, yeah, I set that up for you. I, I planned that. Wow. Until the time 
that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him because in the midst of our pain and suffering and tragedies and obstacles and enemies, in the midst of it, we're being tested. We're being tested how we come through those situations, how we handle that, how do we respond to that? Are we still going to maintain our integrity whenever somebody lashes out at us? Can we behave properly according to the Word of God? Can we still respond the right way? Now, I'm not talking about being a doormat, just laying down and taking everything either. I'm talking about responding the right way. Verse 20 says this, that the king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free, and he made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. This was what happened, and this is what, how God used Joseph. It took a little bit of time. It took years till he got to that place. But through those obstacles, he was tested. His integrity was put to the test. His responses and his, his faith was put to the test. And see, and this is what God was doing with Israel in the wilderness, and they failed. They failed the test. Because no matter what happened, they complained. No matter what happened, they couldn't believe that God was going. I mean, after witnessing all the things and miracles that God did, they still could not believe him, that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. And basically, that's the definition of faith. Faith is basically believing that God will do what he said he will do. That's what faith is. Okay? So they could not, they could not understand that. And so when we begin to get the proper vision, the proper understanding, the proper perspective of what purpose our enemies serve, it will be a lot easier to go through life understanding that. It's not going to make the problems any easier, see. It's not going to make them any less. It's just going to be how do you approach them? How do you view them? How do you see it? Okay, you need to understand that, that you're going to have it. There's going to be enemies, and God said, I'm not going to take care of I'm not just going to remove them from your life. Now, I'll remove the major one, but you're going to have, there's going to be enemies that you're going to come into contact with in your journey. They're going to be there, and they're going to serve a purpose. Now, as you grow, as you handle it properly, as you respond to them in the right way, I'll start driving them out little by little. Little by little, they'll get driven out before you. You keep your focus on me. That's difficult to do. Difficult. We had a difficult time, and we, we, we had to overcome that early on because our minds and our energy and our thoughts were going to what people were doing to us and saying about us, and that was... It was keeping our focus, and we had, to, we had to really discipline ourselves to not focus on that and just say, God, you've you got to take care of that. We've got to do what you called us to do. We have to be obedient to preach your word. We have to be obedient to do what you called us to do and allow you to take care of these all, all these little fires that are being spread about us. Lord, I mean, we cannot take our entire energy and focus trying to defend everything that we're doing. It's a real distraction. And so that was, a, that was a process for us to learn how to handle that, how to respond to that in a proper way, how to trust God through that, how to continue to do what we're doing without having to you know, go around and make sure everybody thinks the right thing about us. Because that's, that's not going to happen anyway, right? And so we had to just be who we were. I mean, we got to a point eventually where we'd hear stuff and start laughing. Boy, that's hilarious. Can you believe that? Somebody, somebody called me one time up and said, is it true that at your church we heard that if you write down somebody's name that you wanted to marry or date and take it up front and throw it on the altar that God would arrange that? I said, I said what? I said, well, somebody went and spread that rumor about us. They said, what is that? And I said, I don't know, it sounds like witchcraft to me. <laughs> you don't do that, do you? And I said, no. I said, I didn't even heard anything like that. But anyway, so, anyway, stuff like, that was one thing. But I mean, there's lots of other stuff. But it was amazing, because when people want to hurt you, they'll, they'll spread rumors about you to other people and stuff. And then, that's why it's important not to, you know, when you hear stuff secondhand, you know, just understand that there's always another side to that. 
So, and I thank God to the ones that came to us, you know, and said, is this really true? Uh, no, it's not. Okay, so we learn that. Now look at Psalm 110. Another perspective, because again, having the proper perspective of your enemy, understanding it. Psalm 110 says this, the Lord said to my Lord, and this is, this is Father talking to the Son, uh, sit at my right hand, right hand is a place of authority, till I make your enemies your footstool. And the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Watch this. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Rule. If you can grab this one phrase today. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Powerful. Rule in the midst of your enemies. God says, I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. Now, just that word right there, when we understand that word, footstool, it gives us, immediately, we see where the enemy is supposed to be. A footstool is under your feet. That's where the enemy is supposed to be. The enemy is supposed to be under our feet. If we also understand the purpose of a footstool, a footstool helps us get somewhere, reach higher than what we other, otherwise could. Did you ever try to reach something up on a top shelf? It can't quite get there, so you grab a little footstool. Put that footstool down, step on top of it. Now you can reach something you could not reach beforehand. I hope you're getting this. This is the purpose of your enemy. Your enemy, if you approach it the right way, if you have the right response and the right attitude toward your enemies, they will put you higher than what you otherwise could get on your own. They will take you to heights that you could not accomplish without them. Like I said, that's what happened with Jesus. You will be able to fulfill and do more when you put the enemy in the right spot. See, too many people have the enemy on their shoulders, on top of their heads, weighting them down, saying, if I could just get rid of the enemy, I could do more. No, if you can, get, if you can switch that around, get them in the proper spot where they're supposed to be, you'll go higher. You'll climb on top of them. Does this make sense? The enemy becomes your footstool. Because see, character, growth, Christian growth and character is strengthened through adversity. If you can see what, what we, we looked at the life of Joseph, how about David? If we wouldn't even know about this guy without an enemy, nobody had ever heard of him. He's some kid out in the field watching sheep. They came to his house. Samuel came to his house to anoint one of, one of Jesse's sons. David wasn't even invited. He wasn't even there. They went down through all the sons and they said, well, it's, it isn't any one of these. Do you have another one? And Jesse's like, you know what? I do have another one. I keep forgetting about that one. That's my youngest one. He's out in the field taking care of the sheep. Sam was like, well, how about going and getting them? Okay, so they brought David in. And David comes in like, hey, what's going on? What's going on? Like, this is the one. This one's been anointed to be king. It was like, this one? There was, not, there was some more jealousy went on with the brothers there too. Get the pattern? They didn't like that either, the brothers, because when he got to, how many know when David got to the front of the, of the, of, of the enemy's line? Remember this, of the, of the army's lines? They come up to Israel on one side, the Philistines were on the other side. Remember this? This guy's been coming out for 40 days, mocking, blaspheming God, Goliath. Everybody was scared to death of him. He was a big guy. Nobody wanted to fight him. And then David showed up. And he heard it. And David thought, no problem. You know why? Now watch this. You know why David was able to approach Goliath with such faith? Because he already had some enemies, see? He had some attacks. He had some obstacles that he already was, was dealing with in the field that nobody else saw. Nobody even knew about it. David was out there alone watching those sheep, and those sheep got attacked. And who would have known if he'd have just left it go, not said a word? But see, David chose 
to do the right thing even when no one was looking. Even when no one was watching. Even when nobody would have known. He chose to do the right thing. And it said when the lion attacked, David killed the lion. When the bear attacked, David killed the bear. So David had already overcome some enemies before he ever met Goliath. It wasn't, so to speak, on behalf of my buddies back here, it wasn't his first rodeo. Okay? He'd been around. He dealt with some things. Right? He knew the deal going in. He saw Goliath, but he didn't see, he, he didn't see it any different. To him, what's the difference? Bear, lion, Goliath. I know how to handle this. My God was with me before. He'll be with me again. When the bear attacked the sheep, I killed it. When the lion attacked the sheep, I killed it. Could be any different with this guy. Same thing. That's what David said. He already seen it. He's already been in. See, David was already an overcomer way before he ever overcame Goliath. The reason he overcame Goliath because he was already an overcomer. Does this make sense to you? Okay, so there's obstacles coming up against you. There's things that's happening. Maybe nobody knows about it. You're dealing with some things. Some things are coming against you. Might be coming against your physical body. Might be coming against your mind. Might be coming, you know, people saying things. See, if we're doing some, something, nobody else even understands it. But you are handling it with integrity. You are responding the right way. You are dealing with it in a godly manner. And guess what? Because as that happens, God will begin to little by little remove those things from your life. You'll have greater enemies to face, praise God. And when you do, it'll be much easier. You'll understand it because you have the faith to come through that. You'll be more of an overcomer and it will launch you into your destiny as that particular event launched David into his destiny of becoming king. It was the first step. Well, it was the first public step. You see, he'd already been anointed. It was already God's purpose and plan for him. You see, Joseph was already called. He already, had the, he already knew the promises of God. He already had the dreams. Nobody else knew him, though. You see, nobody else knew it was going to happen until Pharaoh called him out of prison. And that day, everything changed. Jesse sent David to the front line. And he got to the battle, and there was Goliath, and everything changed. Everything changed because God then exalted him in the public arena because of what he did in the private. See, when we want to fulfill what God's called us to do, we do what's right in private. And when we do what's right in private, God exalts us in public. Does that make sense? We choose to do the right thing. We choose to respond the right way. We choose to look back and say, mm, made a mistake here. Didn't quite hand, I mean, you know how many times I do this? Look back and say, yeah, I didn't do that the right way. I didn't handle that one right. Well, probably going through that test again. Yeah, I didn't respond like I should have there. That was just, that was not God. That was my flesh. Okay? And see, we get the enemy and we begin to understand where the enemy is in our life. And that's what I ask Christians to do. You, you look at it because, because we look all the way. If you look, if you look at the, two, two, the, the first book of the Bible and last book of the Bible, you look in the beginning, we are introduced to an enemy all the way back to the Genesis, you know, it, which, which is amazing to me that God creates man, puts him in the garden, and tells him, I want you to rule in, 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 over this garden. I want you to have dominion over the earth. Now, now watch this. There's going to be an enemy there too, but don't worry about him. You're going to rule anyway. You are capable of ruling whether there's an enemy or not. See, this is the plan of God. Rule in the midst of your enemies, right? God says, you're going to rule over this garden. There's an enemy there, but don't listen to him. Listen to me, and you'll rule. How I many know Adam fell, right? Sin, and the enemy kind of overcame him in that instant. Now, we all have, we all have opportunity to be overcome by the enemy and repent. 
right? Now, what happened is God, we see the enemy introduced as a serpent in the garden. And the first thing God did is when he cursed uh, the man and the woman and he cursed the serpent. Remember that? That's in Genesis 3. So he cursed the serpent, said, on your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat. Remember this? So the serpent was, was cursed to the ground. He was a serpent. We are told in the scriptures that we are to have the enemy under our feet. And so in Genesis, we have a little serpent crawling around in the dust. Something that we are capable of stepping on. Something that we are capable of sticking under our feet. Crushing his head, it tells us, right? We're to crush his head. Now, we get all the way back to Revelation, and all of a sudden we're reading, we don't read about a serpent in the dust any longer. We're reading about something different. We're reading about another, uh, this serpent has now become a dragon. Now, dragons don't wallow in the dust, see? Dragons actually fly. That means they've they've got themselves into another level. They're off the earth, okay? They're into another realm. And they got themselves there. And these things, these things aren't little slithering things in the dust. These things are breathing fire. These things are scary, okay? They're big, they fly, they attack you. And so I always ask Christians, when it comes to the enemy, my question to them is, who is the enemy to you? Who is he to you? Is he a serpent in the dust that you step on, or is he a dragon in the air that you're afraid of? Which one is he? You see, to everybody it's different. To a lot of people, they see the enemy as a big fire-breathing dragon. They're scared to death of him. And others just look at him and say, get away, get out of here, you know, not on my feet, get the heck out of here, what are you doing? You don't have any power over me whatsoever, okay? How do you see him? Now what happens is, the question I asked, how did a serpent grow to become a dragon? So when I looked at that, my first thought is, I wonder what it's been eating. What's it been eating to get to that, to grow to that size? Well, it was cursed to eat the flesh. We understand that we were created or made from the ground or the earth, and the dust represents our flesh, and then eventually the dust or our flesh represents our sin or our sin nature. So anytime we're sinning, anytime we're rebelling against God, what we're doing in our own life is we're feeding the enemy. We're feeding them, see? Anytime we sin, rebel, and disobey God, we just continue to feed him some more. And every time we keep feeding him, he keeps growing. The more he grows, the more difficult it is to get him under your feet because he really isn't under your feet any longer because you fed him too much. The only way you can get the enemy under your feet is you have to starve him. You got to starve the enemy. Too many people are feeding the enemy, and he's ruling over them. Now, that's, not, that's out of order. He's not supposed to be ruling over us. He's supposed to be under our feet. He's supposed to be small. But we fed him too much. Now we're trying to deal with him. Now we want God to take him out. And God's like, I already took him out. God's like, I'm not the one feeding him. Say, stop feeding him, and he'll start shrinking. Quit giving them stuff. You know, what what does that mean? Start walking in the things of God. Start obeying God's word. Start start repenting. Start doing the things that God's called us to do. As we do those things, the enemy starts to shrink. He shrinks so much, we can get on top of him. We can get him back in where we're supposed to be. We can get him back in in, in under our feet. Does this make sense? Okay, so what I want to introduce you today is the mentality and the understanding of the enemy, who he is in your life, okay, how he can become a source for you to reach your destiny, putting it in the right perspective, understanding the purpose of the enemy and where you are with that and how God looks at it and what God does and doesn't just remove them all because we think that's the the right answer. He leaves them there and he lets us, as we grow, he starts driving them out little by little, but not all at once. It all has to do, you see how this works together with God? 
God says, I'll, I'll do it. I, you know, I'm, I'm there for you, but I need you to obey me. I need you to believe me. I need you to follow my word. Okay, and as you do, I'll start driving them out little by little. Does it make sense to you? Okay, I hope this helps you as you take a look. Look back over your life. Look at areas that you said, that was good. I did that right. Oh, that one wasn't so good. I need to, do, I need to change the way I handle that. I need to respond a little bit more uh, godly, in a godly manner and not just flip out whenever things happen like that uh, because I didn't like what happened. Does this make sense? Okay, so you start, you start looking and responding the proper way, and as you do, God starts driving those enemies out little by little, little by little, so that you have less and less enemies to deal with as you go. Amen? And you will be able to then properly inherit the land that God has called you to inherit. In other words, you begin to step into the destiny and the promises that God has for you. You see, if we don't understand the purpose of the enemy and understand how we overcome that enemy, okay, we'll never inherit. We'll never, we'll never step into the destiny God has created for us. We'll, 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 we'll wander in the wilderness and wonder why the enemy is always over our heads, looming over our heads, because we fed him too much. Amen? Let's stand our feet. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for proper perspective. Lord, areas in our lives, in the name of Jesus right now, areas in our lives where we are continuing to feed the enemy, begin to reveal that to us right now, Lord, so that we can repent, so that we can change, so that we can starve him in those areas, so that he's not growing anymore. Lord, I thank you that as we starve him, he he begins to shrink. He's no longer our main problem. I thank you, Lord, that the perspective of the enemy is going to be he's under our feet. He is actually going to help us reach heights that we could not reach without him. As we get him under our feet, he helps launch us up. He helps us rise above every situation so that we can truly rule in the midst of our enemies. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. God bless you all. Love you guys.